Welcome to the Falling Walls Plenary Table from Evidence to Action. Restoring planetary health with science and collaboration. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hi, everybody. Good. Very pleased to be with you all today. I'm Nicole De Paula. I'm the founder of the Women Leaders of Planetary Health, and I'm also an affiliate scholar of the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam. And I'm also passionate about planetary health, so I'm very pleased we're going to have this conversation today. Um, the connection between the triple planetary health crisis, when we talk about climate crisis, the biodiversity, pollution, it's so interlinked with our human health. This connection is proven and it's profound. And yet, it remains overlooked. I think there's much more we can do to recognize that these connections, if you think about the air we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink, the environment we are living, and all the destruction that we are seeing, this war against nature, that's something that we can no longer normalize. So this conversation today will bring this synergies and how we can really uh, overcome uh, the silos, not only the institutional silos of our uh, science institutions but, uh, and governments, but also our mental silos. So if you think about how much of already premature deaths we are experiencing in terms of air pollution over, you know, very conservative numbers, I think it's over 7 million uh, premature deaths every year. Heat waves, extreme heat would bring us to another uh, 5 million premature deaths. So there are many interconnections there, and examples are the rise of non-communicable diseases, infectious diseases, malnutrition. We, have, we had a conversation of hunger this morning, but we didn't talk about also the other silent cries of obesity, for example, that is all connected to the way we are um, evolving and how our food systems are connected. So we really need to overcome this planetary emergency. We need to come together to find solutions, but not only for a privileged few, and that's a very important part of this conversation. Uh, we are continuing also a debate that started with the cascading uh, debates on planetary health around the world, uh, many conversations in different countries, global north, global south, and this table we will pick up on some of these uh, themes there and connect uh, local and global aspects. We also will not be here without the vision of the Frontiers Research Foundation. We're going to learn more about the Frontiers Planet Prize and how, how science really can help us to address these complex um, interconnected problems. So our mission is really to understand the role of science and effective collaboration for planetary health. I'm very pleased to be joined by a stellar panel. Uh, and I would like to welcome Jean-Claude Burgerman, who is the director of the Frontiers Planet Prize, supported by the Frontiers Research Foundation. Welcome. Joe Claude. And <laughs> with us, we have also Patrick Kramer, um, who is director of the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry in Gottingen. Welcome. <laughs> we also have Abir Haddad, founder and director of the Institute for Legal Transformation. Welcome. Next, we have Felix Depardacora, president of the African Academy of Science. <laughs> Welcome, Felix. Last but not least, Fedra Henley, chair of the Center for One Health at the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. Welcome. <laughs> wow. What a great panel. I'm so honored to be here with you all uh, today. And we talked um, about the planetary health, how much of this interconnects, but I think there's a lot, we, we talk a lot about the crisis and we are running, I said uh, at the World Health Summit, we're running out of acronyms to say of, you know, after the COVID, we have conflict, COVID, conflict, uh, climate crisis is the five C, four Cs. But perhaps we can start a little bit of uh, some good news. Uh, and I would like to uh, start with Jean-Claude. When you, the Frontiers Planet Prize has been established and there's a lot of influence in this conversation. So as a director that, what was the vision and the expectation of setting a, a prize like this and how this can contribute? Yeah, well, thank you for the question. And by the way, the acronym is FPP, uh, Frontiers Planetary Prize. So that's an easy <laughs> one to, re to, to remember. So the, the Planetary Prize is a, is, a, is a new prize. It's an initiative of the Frontiers uh, Research Foundation. 
it, it is started today. We launched it on the 22nd of April. We made it public on the 22nd of April. The winners will be announced 22nd of April because that's Earth Day. So it is directly con connected to what you were saying about uh, planetary health. And the whole idea is that we need to speed up science to get solutions for the planetary problems. Uh, we all know that <coughs> science in itself is not the only solution, but without science there will not be a solution. So the, the idea is that it has to go quicker, it has to be more massive, and it has to be, uh, short, it has to shorten the, the normal time of scientific discovery between fundamental going to, to apply it. The idea is to ignite a worldwide competition, but a collegial competition, a eh, scientific competition for the best papers that, that have been uh, published this year and last year with regard to the nine boundaries problematic of, of uh, planetary health, eh, the, 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 the system approach which is advocated by, by your institute, by the way, <laughs> and, um, and that uh, whatever paper that has been published this year scientifically, uh, of course, uh, peer-reviewed, can contribute and can, can um, to the price and to the competition. So every country and for the Global South, we have a special arrangement with the, with the International Science Council can forward nominations. Out of them, uh, a jury of uh, 100 climate scientists, uh, world-renowned, uh, led, led by uh, Johan Rockström, will select the national winners. Out of the national winners, we will go to the three international winners, a bit like the Olympics, and uh, they will receive next year, so uh, in April they will receive, three out of, of the national winners will receive a prize of one million uh, Swiss francs each. And the idea is, of course, not to do it as a one-off, but the idea is to do it on a, as long as the problem is there, which means a lot of time, and uh, that by doing so we inspire funders, universities and scientists to do more. And the second idea behind is that it doesn't matter who you are on the hierarchy of science. It doesn't matter where you are located. It doesn't matter in what journal it is published on condition that it is peer reviewed mm -hmm. so that the peers recognize your quality as a contribution to planetary health. Fantastic, I like this definition, Olympics. So we do start with some great news. I'm sure we're gonna have the time to go to some of the bad news. But uh, two words that is very important, the healthy competition and acceleration. We definitely need to accelerate action and science is a great driver for that. So I'd like to go uh, to you, Patrick. And we see um, these days, we are, there is a sense of urgency, but we need to maintain the sense of urgency that we can need to continue, uh, um, you know, um, focusing on, on problems that look distant you know, climate nowadays not so much because we see flaws, we see things happening these days. But we must uh, combine perhaps, you know, this the short term with the long term needs. Of course, a war in Ukraine this morning had a conversation. That's not something that helps to keep the sense of urgency. So I'd like to to, to hear your views on how could we uh, better balance it, this short term and, and and long term needs. And one of the things is perhaps the the networking, the activism, because science we see a lot of this conversation. Scholars who are activists as well bring this, this knowledge. So, so how do we see you can uh, further engage uh, science and these networks to continue to keep uh, the sense of urgency? Well, thank you very much for having me. Thanks for the question. This is indeed extremely important because we are looking here at a scientific problem of a huge scale, maybe, you know, of the highest complexity. And that needs long-term research as we do it in the Max Planck Society. But at the same time, once we find something, it's very important that we immediately inform people, politics, also, of course, the general public, so that one can work on a policy. i just give you one example, something that comes from the Max Planck Society. You know, nowadays everybody accepts global warming is man-made. But of course, in the middle of last century, it was observed as warming. And then there was research being done, and actually the Nobel Prize to Klaus Hasselmann, a colleague at Hamburg, was because he could prove for the first time that it's human activity that causes global warming. And this, I think, without that, we wouldn't have the Paris Agreement, because obviously you need to establish causal relationship, and that you can only do with long-term research. But at the same time, it's very important for us to then also speak up once we get such insights. And maybe one other aspect when we now you know, move from climate to planetary health, which is even much more complex. Because here we talk about the health of the human civilization in its environment, in its context. And so how can you possibly use that as a subject for research? 
I think the only way to do it is to move from interdisciplinarity to cross-disciplinarity. And the Max Planck Society is in an ideal position to contribute to this goal because we cover a wide range. You know, not only do we look at technology, chemistry, at the environment, biology, the biosphere, ecosystems, we also have experts in law, in economics, in sociology, in anthropology. And I think these need to come together. It's even about developing a common language to be able to do research on planetary health. This is so important, the common language, and we see sometimes how even when we're discussing with private sector, how we get lost in translation. So I think no single country, no single discipline can solve these issues. And we are talking, as we said, is the planetary health goes beyond the climate crisis, which normally we see much more in the media, but there's, you know, the biodiversity uh, uh, themes that uh, we all need to connect more. So if you talk about, uh, there was uh, um, the Antonio Guterres, the UN uh, Secretary General, was saying that um, in the context of the COP27, and, of course, the, the lack of finance that's still not enough uh, on the table. He said, don't uh, underestimate how angry developing nations are. So in this crisis, there are a lot of anger, but there's a, a rise in this echo grief. And, and a lot of the conversations that we need to bring is not only, uh, you know, we talk about infectious diseases, of course, but the mental health crisis that we are experiencing. So I would like to maybe come to you a bit, uh, if you could uh, explain, um, uh, explore a little bit how we can, uh, if you're work, you see these connections between um, uh, mental health and this nature protection. Uh, how could we acknowledge these links and what do you think it should be done? Um, yeah, that's a good question, a very good question. I think everyone should ask themselves because it's like mental health is not a, only a, politi a, politi a policy uh, issue, it's also an individual um, uh, decision. Uh, or um, it requires individual action. So thank you, thank you very much for the question, and thank you very much for having me here. Um, so I would I would like to um, um, to like to name few uh, two points. One is like on the social um, uh, on the social connection. I think we need to strengthen uh, social connection by, by practicing uh, um, compassion. So what my actions here in uh, let's call it developed country has an effect on other people on the other side of the earth. And of course, um, this I need to be very aware of. And we lost kind of uh, the social connection in some parts of the world, at least the world I'm living in. That's why, um, um, that's why I um, advocate for um, learning from other cultures learning from other cultures, especially from indigenous people who still live the life uh, in harmony with nature, in harmony with each other, and uh, which makes them even able to protect 80% um, uh, of biodiversity, uh, even if they are just like 6% of, uh, of the po population, right? So what, what they have is a different mindset than what we do have. We focus very much on uh, our individual um, uh, uh, benefit uh, rather than the community. So this is something I would um, see as very important. On the individual level, I would um, um, I think it's very important to um, seek connection with nature, with uh, with um, the earth surrounding us in every action we do. Um, what I especially do, I do um, spend a lot of time with indigenous people in the desert, sleeping uh, sleeping caves, to be able to sense what it means, what this earth means, that it is a li living uh, being, not only we humans, because we define ourselves as a living being, and we are a subject of law. Again, I'm a lawyer. So we, we define ourselves as the subject of law, and we can rule the world. And we exclude others like nature, like ecosystems, like animals. But this is our decision. Uh, this is our, according to our values, which is very Eurocentric and not um, uh, and um, like uh, it's 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 not like this everywhere in the world. So for me, it's very important to learn from other cultures, especially indigenous people. And then this is where the work comes in from the Institute for Legal Transformation, where we try to learn from those cultures who um, live sustainably with um, with nature and with the resources they do have and try to translate it again, finding a common language to encode these values, these norms, these rules into our, what we call law, to create a sustainable laws for future generations. 
you're really talking and uh, it's the transdisciplinarity that we need. It's beyond only the typical, you know, beyond the walls of academia, but the different ways of knowing that is so important for planetary health. So thank you so much for bringing the, the topic of traditional knowledge, indigenous peoples, and indeed 6% and 80% of biodiversity is there. So a very powerful number. Thank you for that. And Felix, uh, I think also it's connecting a little bit, but we see now how in um, Africa is really being devastated by a climate crisis it didn't cause. There was a headline uh, this week. And uh, of course, there are energy, um, you know, soaring food prices, energy prices, the fiscal limitations for so many countries. So developed countries uh, could be turning inwardly again. That's, that's the risk that we could observe there. So I would like to ask you, how is the theme of planetary health um, uh, perceived in Africa, or how can we make this conversation meaningful in the global south? Thank you very much uh, for the question and for having me here. I must say that um, it's rather very unfortunate that the global south has contributed so little to what we are experiencing, and yet, um, especially Africa, it stands to lose the most because it's more devastated. And, and there are just a lot of issues that also have nothing to do with the rest of the world. In other words, they are unique to the African system. And that's where the struggle is. And many Africans probably do not understand that until some of us start to point it out to them. Uh, for example, um, the soils in Africa are very, very nutrient poor. They're the poorest soils you can get on the planet. That means that when you normally grow crops on them and you do not fertilize, what you have is, whether it's grain or vegetable, is, has got much lower concentrations of all the vital essential nutrients that we need for growth. Now, that's what our people are going through. And as a result of that, Africa has, uh, and typically, of course, the one nutrient that's most lacking is nitrogen. Because of that, Africa has uh, the highest uh, number of people suffering from um, protein calorie malnutrition. You have about 239 million people suffering from protein calorie malnutrition. And because the soils are nutrient poor, we have another scenario, which is trace element deficiency, or sometimes called micronutrient deficiency. Uh, again, there is about 232 million who are suffering from that. So this is already a colossal problem for the continent to resolve. And superimposed on that is what we call uh, you know, climate change or in the broader context, planetary health. And of course, if the planet is not healthy, uh, Africa gets even more sick. It's just like that. And those are some of the, uh, the issues that are very troubling to the continent. And of course, the perception, uh, if I can be straight with you on that, is not a very happy one. In fact, people are very negative, not in the context of finding solutions, but should I say non-negative, but they are angry that they are not accountable, they are not responsible for something they have to pay so much for with their lives. And, and that, I think that is one of the problems that uh, going forward, uh, everyone has to come to the table. It's not equal to what we are having between Russia and Ukraine. Not quite like that. That's, that's a worst case situation. But the African position where it stands in the context of planetary health is in itself a big crisis. And it does require a lot of attention. And what I've just given you is, you know, a tip of the iceberg. That's just about two conditions that are uh, dietarily related, and that is actually a problem to the African people. And uh, if I may just exemplify that, in the case of South Africa, it's a policy decision that all companies that are processing maize or other forms of food into flour must supplement with selenium, with iron, with zinc, with some of them with iodine. It, it tells you what the crisis is like. Other countries that are not doing it, it's just because either they don't know or they don't have the resources or the politicians just don't care. But in the case of South Africa, if you go there, if we have a PowerPoint presentation, I'll share that with you. So this is what we're going through. And uh, then, of course, uh, planetary health also has other dimensions, which you've already alluded to yourself. And it is the health of the people. I mean, you've seen all the, in Africa, you've heard, heard of all the droughts as we talk. Uh, from the Horn of Africa to Kenya, there's been persistent drought for the past three years, especially the northern part of Kenya. Three good years, they've not had a single drop of rainfall. 
So how are they supposed to eat, right? And essentially, if you go further up to uh, Djibouti, the situation is just equally as bad. And then if you crisscross to West Africa, you get the opposite. Two years ago, one within 32 hours, there was just continuous rain till you know, the rivers got over flooded, bridges were blown off. So from the north, the south going to the north, uh, you couldn't go by road. The military people got into their helicopters, and that's the only way they could transport people across. And that's just all as a consequence of uh, the ill health of our planet. And so, yes, the African people are not excited about it. And that's why something like COP27, I don't think many of them are optimistic. They've heard these promises before, and nothing comes true. So, you know, it's, a people behave like a child. If you promise a child a biscuit and you don't bring the biscuit, there'll be mistrust. So right now, I don't think the African people actually do trust these me big meetings where uh, politicians arrive, uh, presidents and ministers in high-level suit talking big, but they deliver nothing. So I have to be very frank. This is the position. That's the perception. Uh, it's dire, but that's because the people themselves are in a dire street. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, the issue of trust is one of the most important in this conversation because we're not gonna solve any problem connect planetary health without solidarity and without addressing these issues that uh, uh, you are bringing. So thank you so much. And uh, Fedra, I would like to come up to you because there were many, uh, I mentioned this cascading debates, uh, many connection in, in Kenya, in Canada, in Mexico. And one of the important aspects, uh, if you want to drive change, it's not only the big meetings and the summits. Actually, that's why I'm here, because I think this conversation, uh, bringing these very important players can be even more powerful uh, than these big summits. But how can we um, effectively achieve behavior change? And, and um, is slow down just really this, this environmental degradation, but it, we need to be in an inclusive way. So I know you've been working a lot of on One Health, there is also planetary health. Could you expand a little bit how in your work or in your center, how are you um, um, going beyond the technical aspects to address also behavior change? Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Nicole. Thanks for the, the question. And um, I have the privilege to uh, work at the University of Global Health Equity. I've been living um, in Rwanda for the last uh, six years, and there's a lot of, um, you know, positive lessons that I think the, the rest of the world can um, uh, learn about from how uh, Rwanda is institutionalizing uh, planetary health or a One Health approach. So I'm going to talk about planetary health or One Health, which is looking at the links between animal environment and human health as, as an approach to looking um, at health and you know despite many countries in Africa as Felix mentioned um, you know being on the the losing end of a lot of these impacts of environmental change I think there's a lot of um, innovation in how uh, One Health or planetary health is being uh, used uh, is being institutionalized uh, so I can give you know two examples uh, of my experience uh, working in Rwanda, and that's through education um, and through governance, One Health governance. Um, and I think both these two ways can uh, change uh, behavior. Um, so at a, an educational level in higher education, uh, at UGHG, my university, as well as other universities in Rwanda are integrating planetary health and One Health concepts across all programs. So we're looking into different curriculum and integrating these concepts of how we need to look at health through different lenses, animal, environment, social, political, so that professionals in you know, each of these programs can see the importance and the value of planetary health or One Health approach. Um, and again, I know I'm lucky to, to work at a university that allows me to do that, um, but I think it gives a, a, a strong example of how you can um, educate different professionals to uh, understand and appreciate 
One Health or Planetary Health in, in their own professions. Um, so an example is we have a, a medical school um, and we teach our students to take a One Health patient history, we call it. So uh, our medical students are being uh, taught to ask questions perhaps about mental health concerns from a changing climate so they can recognize those concerns uh, when they're taking patient history. Uh, the other example of um, you know, a success story in One Health uh, is in One Health governance, and this is very strong in, in East Africa, particularly where One Health is formalized at a governance level. Uh, so in Rwanda, for example, there is um, a formal One Health steering committee, which is made up of different ministries uh, across the country. Um, they uh, have a common basket approach of funding. Um, they work together to address different planetary health challenges, um, including most recently uh, COVID. Um, and there's been studies that shown that this kind of formalized One Health or planetary health governance has created better outcomes of um, some of these challenges, particularly uh, COVID-19. Um, so yeah, despite you know being uh, having a lot of negative health social impacts from environmental crisis, I think uh, you know the region of Africa is leading in uh, using this approach to health to address some of these concerns. Thank you so much, and it's exciting to learn. If you, I've been dealing with uh, and, and learning. My background is in international relations, so I'm I'm not a medical doctor, and I just love that I get so many invitations in public health schools, which is something I would never imagine. But this shows that we need to cross fertilize knowledge uh, across, you know, many of uh, of the disciplines. So it's very exciting to learn. I see also in Germany uh, many uh, public health schools changing uh, curriculums and and having uh, a, a new new ways and new approaches to understand uh, human health that doesn't start at the hospital, right? Please. Thanks. I, I like what Fida has said. Um, part of the challenge I've had, especially from the point of view of being the president of the African Academy of Sciences, is to emphasize to our colleagues from the global north that health actually starts with nutrition. If you eat healthy and enough food, you are less likely to be infected by multiple diseases. Now, many of our colleagues and funders will come and they selectively pick one disease or the other, uh, which is not really the, the key problem of the people. The most important problem is to eat well and eat nutritious food. And as I said, if uh, children and adults are eating macronutrient deficient, uh, you know, rice or maize, you know, it's not likely that they'll be healthy enough. And yet, people can pump a lot of money into the region and believe that they are eradicating a set, certain diseases. But in the real game, they're not, because so long as children continue to eat, uh, you know, uh, low protein food, they only just have calories carbohydrate to burn, and that's about it. So I'm very glad to see that the concept of One Health actually has incorporated all of that in addition to uh, you know, planetary health. Thank you. It's amazing your example, Felix, and now you're going to push me also to say something, uh, that uh, the food systems uh, is, is responsible for one third of greenhouse gas emissions. And yet, it's the first time we see at the COP27, uh, uh, you know, food pavilions, for example. And last year was the first time uh, we saw uh, the health pavilion, for example, which shows that these links are still not well established, despite this being so obvious. They are not. So something definitely we need to, to work more on. I would like to have then maybe, of course, a conversation uh, among us and trying to understand a little bit from your perspectives and if there is any advantage of this planetary health narrative how do you see this evolving and and how can we continue pushing because in the end what we want is systemic change and and climate crisis which we hear more it's one aspect right so maybe if i start with you and then yeah well i think the advantage of of the concept is that it, it as i said before it it uh, illustrates it's a systemic crisis, huh? which means that everything is interrelated. That's at the same time, it's also the problem. Because if everything is interrelated, you need this kind of cross-disciplinary uh, approaches and solutions. 
which also is an opportunity because that's where the novelty lies. So I think the whole idea of this planetary health is, is, is very powerful. Um, and and I, we like to translate that into, into something that we call the green renaissance. You know, what we really need to achieve is re-engineering, green engineering, eh? re-engineer, engineer and green, you put it together to get to this planetary health in a way that it is a progress and not a re uh, going backwards because that is something policy does not like. If you, can, if you can give a perspective that by the science and the systems and the actions that we do, we create a next level of our civilization, to put it in, in big words, that is something people can rally about it. And the planetary health is the key transversal concept that everyone agrees. And it was said also in the previous panel, eh? it is, we are all together on the Titanic, eh? some in first class, some in third class, but it's a Titanic. And if we want to change the Titanic away from the crash in the planetary health, we need to do this way. Yeah. We have some billionaires trying to take us to another planet, but Absolutely. so far we have And that's a dynamic this concept, one. you know? <laughs> it's a dynamic way of phrasing the problem, and yeah. that we need, because we need also to give hope. Eh? We need to show that it is possible with science, with actions, and so on. Definitely. Patrick. Uh, I think it's an extremely important concept. Um, so we have responded to this by founding a new institute for geoanthropology. And so why do we need yet another institute? It's for that reason. You know, just over the last year, there have been a number of studies showing that ecosystems are, you know, and how they change is related, of course, to climate change, but it's also related, um, and that's only seen, you know, recently to new diseases. And why is that? It's because most of the new infectious diseases are zoonotic diseases, where, you know, vectors jump or uh, the causing agent is jumping from an animal or from an insect uh, to humans. And it turns out that you know, where these animals live depends strongly on human intervention. So for example, if you have a region that gets urbanized or so, animals will also get there. And those are often the ones that spread the new diseases. So also changes in land use because of climate change will change the habitat of animals. And so diseases are moving. And we are all endangered by that. And so in addition to this very important point, you know, good nutrition, good water, which is really the absolute basic and must be provided by all means, you know. But in addition to that, then the next danger, I would say, is infectious diseases. And this is accelerated. The spread of new infectious diseases is accelerated by climate change and by something that we call the Anthropocene which is a new era that we're entering, a new geological era where man is actually shaping the planet. And this new institute is trying to understand and to quantify and to establish causal relationships in this interface between you know, humanity and the planet. How do we interact with the planet and what is the feedback loops? And if we can establish these causal relationships, then we can also derive policies. But of course, you know, this may take a very long time because it's, so the things we already know we should address immediately. And if you wish, I can say a few things spontaneously about Africa. I think wonderful project that you have described. It's very important to do things locally and try to improve locally. But in addition to that, what is actually our strategy? When I say our, I mean Europe's or the West's strategy. Um, to partner up with Africa, right? What is our strategy? Because Africa has all these resources, people, there's the, the unique ecosystems, there's an almost endless possibility to generate renewable energy. So there is all these opportunities for partnership. And what is actually our strategy? To learn from what we have understood scientifically and also from the new technologies that we have, you know, to transport hydrogen, all these things. But what is our strategy to implement them? We need, of course, politics, we need industry. Uh, it's a big effort, but it should be intensified. We need a vision, a holistic vision of all of this. So thank you so much. I'll go. I'll, do you mind? Yeah. Pedro. Sure. Um, yeah, I think uh, planetary health provides, um, you know, a common language and a, a way to, um, you know, provide a, a narrative, either good or bad, of environmental change. Um, so it brings, you know, different disciplines together with 
uh, you know, how different um, components are coming together to create these environmental changes. Um, our founder of the university and global health icon, Paul Farmer, um, never said no to a challenge, and he called them failures of imagination. Uh, so I think that you know planetary health is a way to combat that and to address their failures of imagination of people saying no that it's not possible to um, you know reverse climate change or it's not or it's p impossible to stop these environmental crises. So it gives the, this lens to address what people are thinking are, are impossible tasks. Thank you. Felix, should we still develop planetary health then, despite all the inconsistencies that we see? I, I think we challenge? should. I think so. Uh, what Patrick has said is so uh, spot on. And it's something I was going to conclude with, but it doesn't hurt to put it out now. Uh, and, and here I'm talking to Jean-Claude, and um, indeed, let me not say to him, but I'm talking to um, the Frontiers Foundation, as well as the uh, Fallen Walls Foundation. I think it's a wonderful, uh, you know, uh, interaction, or should I call it partnership? Partnership is better. Uh, and I see a lot more coming out of it. I actually, I'm one person that does not believe in blaming others if I cannot, in the midst of the challenge, challenge myself. And I see the politicians will do what they do best. And those who have the means, the resources, if you go and look at that, it's mind-boggling that only a handful of people are so rich on this planet and you know, couldn't be bothered about what we are worried about. But I think that in our own small way, we can still do a lot. And I was just thinking, at the end of all this, is this just another conversation we are having at the round table? And I thought I, w I should be able to make a strong request to uh, the Fallen Walls Foundation and the Frontiers Foundation. Since you're working together on this project, and I see you so concerned about uh, you know, planetary health. Uh, I'm, uh, in many ways, I would say I would like to challenge the two foundations to go beyond that and, and to work with other foundations, other philanthropists. And if we're going to talk about uh, food and nutritional uh, uh, challenges with, uh, with planetary health, we can do it without the politicians coming to the table. All we need is just money. And just for that aspect alone, let's take, for example, you can, if we can get some money, we can make a calling, just like the, the issue of the prize. We do the same thing for research. Uh, in Africa, in Asia, or we'll call it the Indian subcontinent, in South America, uh, the, the global north may not need that kind of support, but the global south does. And in this context, I'm not including China. I'm just talking about the ones that are really properly defined as global south. Now, if there's, if there's some money thrown at them, they can, some competitive research can be undertaken, or just say we want a group of people with expertise to come together and write a big proposal that will address, one, uh, early maturing uh, food crops, whether it's cereals or whether it's legumes. Once you've identified that, in the African region, because there are many countries involved, they've been tested in different places, you arrive at material that can withstand uh, you know, uh, all the um, uh, poor rainfall. That's what I mean by uh, early maturity. Then you can also identify the ones that are drought tolerant. Now, one of my students did identify cowpea as 48 days maturity. So it means in one and a half months, if you get two rainfalls, a farmer can get something to eat. Or if you've got a dug up dam, you can use that, even if it's just with a bucket, you can irrigate and get something to eat. So there are many ways we can solve problems instead of waiting for the politicians. And if we can do that across Africa, we can get material that's suitable for that region. Similarly, we'll get material that's suitable for the, in, the Indian subcontinent. And similarly, we'll get material that's suitable for uh, Latin America. Mm -hmm. And similarly, while doing that, we can then look at the biology of drought tolerance. And again, we can get material that can be tested in multi-locations or countries and distribute that. Once we've done that, it's mitigation against climate change. We won't worry about food and nutritional uh, quality or, 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 or uh, uh, 
what do you call it? Uh, yeah, let's just say food and nutritional uh, quality. That problem is solved for good, and we don't have to worry about it. We can then tackle some of the other issues. So for me, I think uh, um, planetary health has called upon us to think out of the box and to think of ourselves as common humanity. If we can take that approach and other people are willing to come to a table with you and uh, uh, the um, uh, frontiers and the fallen walls, I think we can solve the food and nutritional problem without any difficulty. I'm convinced. Thank you. Thanks. This is fantastic. We are coming out of concrete uh, proposals here on this table. I like it's beyond a, a conversation, so we hear uh, very clear ideas. Thank you so much for that. Abir. Okay, Felix, now it's really hard for me to continue <laughs> after this very serious uh, request. So I want to continue with the request too, but not to the both foundations, but to all the researchers and scientists here. Because um, one idea is, like I'm, I'm a comparative lawyer, so coming from a comparative law perspective is, uh, uh, like in order to practice comparative law, you need to leave the, uh, your mindset of what law is or how you have been taught law, what, like, you know, your way of thinking, your paradigm of law and that how things should be, how contracts should be. So you need, it took me a, a while to, like, step out of this and then to um, step into other legal frameworks. So when I did this, it, 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 it um, taught me, um, like, it was really, really difficult because I was taught that way. I was try uh, trained very much that way, that what I think and the way law is, is the right way. And because this is how I got my grades and my summa cum laude, right? So, um, uh, but stepping out was so enriching and learning from other legal frameworks and uh, stepping out defining what law is and legal framework is and how others could look like, which is not according to my way of thinking. So my request here is to all the <laughs> researchers and, and scientists here is like, we don't need to act like we're inventing uh, planetary health. Okay, it's like, oh, we need to do more science, we need to find more things out in order to solve the climate change uh, crisis. No, we don't. Like, this is fine, we need science, but as you said, science is not the only solution. And why don't we um, also have respect from other knowledge, like science or researchers are collect collectors of knowledge, right? But you have so many people on this earth who are not represented here, right, who have... a a huge amount of knowledge which is from ancestors to ancestors, like gave, um, gave, gave to them from their ancestors and collected in a language we do not understand. This is but our problem. So we need to step back, get out of our box, think out of the box, and look what is out there we can benefit for, for whole humankind. So researchers or resources of knowledge is not only from researchers who do look like researchers, maybe they look quite different. Like, look at me. I don't look like a typical researcher, yes, yet I'm sitting here, right? So there's so many um, versions of knowledge we can benefit from, and I feel like we do too less, and this is something I, like, I hit my walls all the time when it comes to uh, legal transformation. <laughs> so, I think we all need a humility, right? Yeah. It's in the leadership, that's a very important word that's easy to say, but we see less in concrete terms. So thank you so much. And I think we have seven minutes, and do we have questions from our digital participants? Yes, so just a reminder, if you're watching online, you can leave your questions in the chat and I'll get them over here. But if you're watching in person, then please raise your hand and we'll try and get a microphone to you. Um, to start off with, we have a question from our online audience, from Otman, who asks the impact we could have on planetary health, health um, if companies working on healthcare, on food, on sports, there was some... Uh, uh, quantifiable metrics on the impacts of the products coming out of organizations like these um, in terms of how much they actually impacted our health around the world. So metrics on... Metrics uh, for the products in the realms of healthcare, food and sports specifically Omen is interested in. Anyone would I like can to say a few words, a Please. few general words. I mean, statistics are good to have. They're important to analyze the situation, to monitor how you improve or whether you don't improve, gets worse. But, you know, 
in the end, individual people count, and so it's important to learn from each other the way you, you said it. Um, but you know, just to put it in context, we're now 8 billion, and in 2050, we'll be 10. And by the end of the century, that's what most people expect. We are at the, at the peak, 11 billion people. So what we need to do um, to protect these people is to decarbonize. That's the most, of course, we need to have food, we need to have water, but we need to decarbonize our energy sector, uh, the transport, and so forth. And this is the main goal. And so you can measure all these things, right? And there have been agreements, but we have to get faster. So we have to do what we can to decarbonize the system. And then, actually, technology does matter. Because, for example, Germany cannot produce the hydrogen we need for our you know, huge industry. So we need to produce it somewhere and get it here. But how do you get it here? You need to convert it to ammonia, convert it back. You need to invent new catalysts and so forth. So technology is important uh, to reach this very important goal to protect those people, a growing population and access to this technologies uh, in a broad scale. We have a question from my neighbour here in the physical audience. If we could get a microphone over here and please stand and introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Shifa Abdin. I'm a PhD student in Hanover Medical School. I have the privilege to be among you here today, but I also want to follow up on the serious request that was just mentioned with a serious request uh, from my uh, side, being originally Syrian as well. So I was very inspired with all the topics that came to the table. And um, I mean, <laughs> we heard the sentence that money can solve a lot of issues, yet we are in the 21st century and it's not solving a lot of is serious issues in, ver in very different places all over the world. So I would also like to follow, because I'm privileged now to pursue my dreams and uh, get my PhD uh, degree, hopefully soon. Uh, however, I know a lot of people who are unfortunately in a lot of conflict areas who are not as privileged, and we can help a lot with uh, such amazing foundations and such amazing platforms. So I would like to follow up, uh, follow up on that serious request with a small request from my humble side that we can really voice out uh, um, uh, with the knowledge that we have the resources to a lot of conflict areas and help out as much as we can to have uh, the new generation helping out the, uh, the globe and the universe for the planetary health that we all aim for. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for this, this comment. And of course, the, the conflict and, and forced migration, I was just also in a conversation on, on refugees and how I think we were there. It shows that we, we care about in the each dimension of ethics. So, so I don't know if anyone would like to also comment on this or on request. And do you have other questions? We have yes, two are, minutes. There are also um, questions and comments that have come out of the cascading debates over the year. And there's one um, that caught my attention from, um, from Mexico. Um, corruption is a major barrier to sustainable development. How can we actually bring, uh, build a strong relationship between uh, the scientific basis of planetary health and the public, and I guess um, this connection needs to somehow overcome this barrier that is seen through corruption. I'm happy to try it. Um, I think it's always better not to talk about corruption because it's become a global phenomenon. It's come to stay with us. I don't see any country where there's no complaint about corruption, and it's not just with the politicians. It cascades down to all of us. Uh, like I said before, my view is let's do what we can do by ourselves, for ourselves. Once you do that, you are in a better position then to turn around and criticize the people who are corrupt, those who are taking the money away from the poorest of the poor. If we start to tackle the issue of corruption with politicians, how are you going to do it? I mean, they've stolen the money, they've put in their bank accounts. How are you going to get that back? But if we are able to feed the poorest of the poor and prove to them that we are able to do what we've done simply because we've had the, uh, the goodwill to support the poorest of the poor. I think there will be a strong message that will be sent to them to say that corruption doesn't help. It, only help, it, it can only reduce uh, the quality of life of your own people. Otherwise, I just, there are just some things I think I cannot fight. Thank you.
I'm coming from Brazil, so we have a long story of the 20s <laughs> and recent election, so My it is, is the third one. It's a, a long <laughs> conversation there. But I would like to, if I can, uh, we have one minute and it's an impossible mission, but we talk about uh, if we could have maybe some of the policy priorities, because the topic is so broad, right? Could we conclude very quickly, if you would like to, moving forward on this agenda? How can we <laughs> prioritize what would be your recommendation for policymakers on planetary health? I'll start here then. Okay, I'll, I'll start. I mean, um, as to reflect on the values which are reflected in our laws. I can't, sorry, I'm a lawyer, so I need to talk about lawyers all, all the time because for me, this is the backbone of everything because everything we produce, every knowledge we produce, we need somehow to put it into law so, to get it implemented and enforced somehow. So, um, uh, um, governments and national states are losing their, um, um, uh, their necessity if they, don't, um, if they don't tackle this for the future and future generations uh, especially. Refractive values. Yeah, in addition to the decarbonization, I think education is really key. Prioritize education. Joseph. Yeah, well, I have two priorities actually. Uh, so. So no, the, the first one is that I think that all science that is important for tackling the issues of planetary health should be openly available to anyone in the Open world. Science. The, the science, the results and the data, which would allow anyone, anywhere, to, co to take part in the race for the solutions. Uh, because if it is not openly available, you just have higher thresholds uh, if you're not in a privileged position. And the second thing, I think the, what, what also uh, Felix was, was and, and, and you were mentioning, is that we need to, to think policy-wise in proportionality, meaning those who contributed most to the problem and those who can afford most of it should also invest most of it. And there, I think, a very interesting idea has been proposed by uh, Sapiens, the, the so Yuval Harari's uh -huh. uh, think tank. Yeah? So he calculated, and it wasn't disputed up till now, that if we would invest 2% of the world GDP in finding solutions, we could address the problem. Now, if every country would invest 2% in a proportional way, it's a fair system. Uh, it, it would take into account those who caused less of the problems who are poorest, but at least the effort would be there. So a worldwide agreement on 2% to be invested in, in SNT would be a, a huge step uh, in, in, in the right direction, because otherwise it, it's... You need the money to do the research. Thank you. Do need the money and the right framework. So, Pedra. Uh, yeah, just quickly, I would say that all the policies need to be seen with a lens of equity okay. and how we address those most vulnerable. Um, the disparities of risk and outcome that we are seeing are not random. These are structural and social forces that are, are in place. So, uh, any sort of policies needs to address those inequities and those most vulnerable. Thank you so much. Felix. I don't have much to add. I think... Uh, <laughs> Your request. <laughs> yeah. He, he's expanded my request, so I'm happy about it. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are 000. We have to finish. But I hope we convinced you all, ladies and gentlemen, that planetary health is from, it's everyone's business. And we are here really to uh, break down silos of institutions and mindsets. So I would like to thank you, all of you, for being very concrete. We have clear recommendations here. And I'm sure we're going to be following up with all of you. I would like to connect. And I think we forgot, and I think we have someone who mentioned in the morning, if sometimes the solutions are not always this tech and, and you know the hard science we need to is about equity we need to and uh, of course as founder of women leaders of planetary health there's a lot of things that if we only have more diversity in decision making uh, there's a lot of things that we can solve so thank you so much for being here with us and i hope we let's continue the conversation uh, in the corridors thank you very much